So how did your association with Leonard Bernstein begin? Leonard Bernstein's sister, Shirley, was my agent. Um, and that's really how this all came about. And uh, Godspell had just opened um, at a tiny little theater off Broadway. Meanwhile, Lenny had committed to writing a piece for the uh, inaugural uh, performances at the Kennedy Center, basically in honor of John F. Kennedy. And everything was all set. And meanwhile, Lenny was finding himself stuck trying to organize um, this piece. And so it was May of 1971, late May, and the Kennedy Center was due to open in September, and he didn't have a piece. So he was uh, getting pretty panicky at this point. And he had some, he had a lot of music written and he had the concept, but he didn't really have any other um, organizing principle, if you will. And so, and he didn't have a lot of these English uh, texts, the parts of the, uh, of the piece that were supposed to be in English, a lot of these were not written. I think he'd approached some of his other um, longtime collaborators and for various reasons they weren't available or it didn't feel a good fit to them or whatever. Sort of in desperation, uh, his sister and my agent suggested that he come see Godspell and if he liked it, uh, maybe I could be of help to him. So that's what occurred. and. Um, so towards the end of May of 71, uh, I went up to his uh, apartment and um, we had a meeting and tried to figure out how we were going to, you know, what we were going to do with this. What were your impressions of the piece throughout the collaboration? Um, obviously, there was all this wonderful music. And um, when I think of Lenny's music, I particularly think of his uh, ability and flair for rhythm and for doing melodies that were in various rhythms, you know, not in 4-4 four, four time or 3-4 time, and yet seemed absolutely inevitable. Mass was full of things like that and full of wonderful tunes. There was a lot of music, which I really liked, but there was no organizing principle to the to, mm. There was no real structure to the piece. Um, so it seemed at once, you know, beautiful and exciting, but chaotic. Um, and so, you know, the, the task was to try to keep the beautiful and exciting and decrease the, the amount of chaoticness of the structure as much as possible very quickly. I got an LP set of The Mass when I was quite young and listened to it and loved it. But seeing it at Ravinia last summer, the piece seems to hang together much better than it did in the past. And uh, I, I wonder about your impressions about why that might be. I, I agree with you. I feel that it's a piece that a little bit surprisingly has aged extremely well and that it actually seems more successful artistically than it did when it first appeared. And I think there are a few reasons for this. One is that classical music, if you will, or what we define as classical music, has caught up to what Lenny was doing, um, which is that he used all different sources. And he threw in jazz and he threw in his version of pop and he threw in various folky rhythms. And then, but then there were, you know, 12 tone areas. And this was not what classical music was supposed to be in the 70s. Um, everybody was, you know, particularly academia was still very much in the 12 tone Schoenberg serial music um, area. So when this piece came out, it just seemed inexplicable. It seemed like a hodgepodge. Now so much of classical music does this very thing. It turns out that Lenny was ahead of his time. So now it feels very comfortably within a kind of contemporary American, you know, classical tradition, if you will. Secondly, I think that Lenny's sort of version of pop um, music, which in the 70s felt 
dated um, because it wasn't what was happening right, right then, now just feels like, you know, his version of pop, as opposed to um, falling a little um, oddly on the ear. And then I also think that the removal of it from the specific politics of the time, and particularly the Vietnam War and this being a piece that was very political in a lot of those ways. As you may know, you know, Nixon was warned against going to see it because who, Nixon, who was president at the time, because it might have proven embarrassing to him. And, you know, there were a lot of political overtones that now um, don't exist anymore. So I think as a, as a piece, it just it, it, it exists um, on its own with its own kind of integrity than maybe it did at the time. Can you point to any specific Leonard Bernstein influence on your subsequent work? Do we hear Lenny in Wicked, for yes, instance? Of course, of course. You need only need to listen to the the first song of uh, the, the first musical number in Wicked. No one mourns the Wicked, and listen to the last chord, um, or the last three or four bars, and and the the influence is obvious, but. Um, Lenny, Lenny was very influential on me, both in terms of the music he conducted particularly well that I listened to um, as a kid before I ever knew him, and as a composer himself. Um, that was all, you know, in, in my head long before I met him, so even though I was 23 when, when I did this, um, you know, I feel like there'd been a decade of Lenny, you know, me listening to Lenny before that. Stephen Schwartz, thank you so much for making time for us on WFMT, reminiscing about Leonard Bernstein and your experience with uh, Mass and your contribution to that work. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I'm delighted that it's going to be aired and I look forward to watching and it's been a pleasure to speak with you.